It's time for Inside Seminole Basketball with Leonard Hamilton, breaking down game-changing plays, momentum-shifting moves, can-miss matchups. The inside scoop on the team and what's next for the Knolls as they look to make another tournament run. ABC 27 presents Inside Seminole Basketball with Leonard Hamilton. Live from Glory Days Grill in Tallahassee. Sponsored by these businesses. Good evening, Seminole fans. Welcome and hello from Glory Days Grill and uh, wherever you may be listening. Tom Block, pinch hitting for Jeff Colhane, and pleased to be joined by head coach Leonard Hamilton as we talk Florida State men's basketball for the next 60 minutes. And, uh, Coach, it, it is good to see you. I know you're in the, the middle of the season. It is the, the grind of what can be a, a long season. And as we look back, uh, we'll start with the game against Pitt this past Saturday, and that was a, a one or two possession game the whole way. You guys took the lead maybe midpoint of the – for the second half, ultimately Pitt prevails, and that's a team that's atop the ACC right now. Your takeaways in the immediate aftermath of that game the other day? Well, whenever you lose a close game, um, especially one of this was that hard fought by both teams, you always look toward the, what happens at the end of the game to determine whether or not you won or you lost. But when you go back and watch the film, you see so many mistakes that we're making that are youthful, inexperienced mistakes, things that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't always meet the public eye. I mean, like how your hand placement has, was when the guy made a pass, you know, or whether or not your inside foot was up so you can see your man and the ball and you, you don't lose sight. Uh, they scored 22 points off of their offensive rebound. They had, they had 15, but we only scored eight off of the – eight points off of our offensive rebound. That's the being a little stronger, a little more uh, experienced at finishing around the basket and drawing fouls. And those are things sometimes you ask, we ask at our guys, uh, our, our younger guys, and less experienced guys, to be more efficient than what they are. And that's where our, our battle uh, starts. Thank goodness we're getting a few more guys into the rotation. Tom House and <clears throat> and Jackson, um, uh, Naheem's back healthy now, along with Baba. It does give us a decent rotation where uh, we're not playing guys in any real heavy minutes because a lot, lot of the mistakes we've been making has been, have been fatigue mistakes. But overall, I think we're making progress. Well, we're just not getting close enough with this team in order to be successful. Um, I'm, I'm sure that it weighs heavy on their heart because I know it does mine. Every morning I get up, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about what we could do to make this team better. And you're always concerned about what did I miss um, in the past that allowed us to, to get back in the situation. And I think we've sorted all that out. Now we've got to finish the season strong. Coach, one of the bright spots uh, in that defeat the other day was the play of Jalen Worley. I know you, you talked post-game about encouraging him to be more aggressive. It seemed like he was a little more assertive in that game, had a career-high 23 points. Well, what happens here is that if, if Jalen is driving the basket on uh, Darren Green's side, that, that side is always open because they re people are reluctant to leave him. And it's a big adjustment for him <clears throat> to be face-guarded and almost boxed at one. Uh, a lot when we play, but one of the things that we're trying, we're working on now, it, it, we're trying to establish uh, inside game. If you in the past, you've always seen us throwing lobs to our big guys and, and throwbacks and giving them the ball two feet in the paint. Back is Ojo and Bernard James and you know Fiondu and Chris Chris Kamaji, and we have not established an inside game yet. So, what people are doing, they're loading up defensively on the perimeter because they don't feel like they have to worry about us, the ball goes inside, which doesn't give us, you know, sometimes the, the help of recovery or the moving the ball well enough to allow their defense to make a mistake. Coach, one of the things uh, <coughs> outside of the game but directly related, and you've done this the last several years, but it was a, a coaching for literacy game. And uh, people may have noticed that you had a green wristband on or a, a green pin here, and I know you and your assistants uh, <coughs> support that cause. Just wanted to give you a moment to, to uh, expound upon that a little bit. Well, you talk about literacy. What you're talking about is education. And there are so many people that are involved in unfortunate situations where their young kids especially don't have the means 
or what have you to get a good start in, from e in their education. It's been proven many times that certain kids from certain environments only get exposed to 3,500 words before they're, before they're three years old. And then on the other ones, they, um, they're exposed to 350 different words before they get to be three years old. So some kids start out behind, it's difficult for them to catch up. So we, we like to be a part of, of trying to bring attention to that area and hopefully um, from an education standpoint we'll find a way to improve it. Well, it's a uh, tip of the cap to you and your staff for supporting that on an annual basis. Coach, just a, a final thought on the pit game, and then as the show moves along, we'll turn the page, and I'll dig a little deeper on uh, your rotation and, and some of the guys there. Uh, the, the second chance points to, to pit, and I, and I guess you probably hit this, but really it's just in terms of getting more inside from your guys defensively and offensively, it's experience and just getting a little stronger, just getting more, acc more acclimated to the game. Yes. Um one of the reasons why we've been so efficient over the years, we've been able to win with thir we got a, a national record of 13 overtime games because we've always been real fresh in the last 10 minutes mm -hmm. of the game. And we don't have the luxury of having that, that rotation uh, that we've been accustomed to having. And we have to, this year, be who we have not, who we have not been for a while. And so we, we, we want to keep our same system in because we believe it works, and, and, but it doesn't work with, if you don't have quality depth in guys with experience. So, so you know, this has been a, um, not a frustrating year, but a very challenging year. Mm -hmm. But I do believe, personally, I've learned more uh, this year about the challenges that we face now in, in collegiate uh, athletics, dealing with youngsters with the different landscape. And uh, with the portal and everything else that's going on, so so it, it, we have zeroed in on how we need to fix this, and you can rest assured that we won't be having this kind of conversation in the future. <laughs> we are talking with head coach Leonard Hamilton. We're at Glory Days Grill. It's the perfect spot for game day and every day of the week with daily food and drink specials, award-winning burgers and the best darn wings in town. When it's time to pack the tuck, Glory Days Grill supports the Florida State basketball team. Glory Days, home of inside Seminole basketball, and we have just tipped things off. We will continue our conversation with head coach Leonard Hamilton momentarily. This is Inside Seminole Basketball from Learfield. Glory. Once again, Seminole fans, time now for What's on Tap, presented by the official craft beer of the Florida State Seminoles. That is Oyster City Brewing Company. Check out the tap room on Gain Street. And, uh, Coach, let's talk a little bit about your, your schedule this week. Obviously, you played Saturday. Uh, you're going to be hitting the road tomorrow. you got a game against Clemson on uh, Wednesday and then back home on Saturday. But I'll let you break that down a little further in terms of how you allocate all the time you'll spend with your team this week. Well, today was a um, debriefing on the – um, Pittsburgh game and that was not quite as long because we realized we got kind of a quick turnaround when we get ready to play on Wednesday and then we had a very thorough um, scouting report on on uh, Clemson and we went went over the things we did um, from a strength standpoint uh, against Clemson and w things we had to duplicate going into the next game we realized that they would make some adjustments uh, I'm um, sure when they watch the film. And then um, we, we went over some of our lack of execution um, that could have made a big difference in that particular game that we got we to gotta be more consistent with. So uh, those are things that, that we went over today um, that hopefully, you know, will give us an opportunity to go into, go into a road game against Clemson. And I'm sure we're going to get their attention because we had such a close – a competitive game here um, that and they're the number one team in our league I believe are they still in that one number one position I think they're right up there okay yeah. so so uh, this is a very important game for us and a very important game for them they've lost several games as of late and I'm sure they want to protect their opportunity to go to the NCAA and possibly win the ACC so we <laughs> we have a work cut out for us but 
I think mentally we'll be right on point. Yeah, let me dive deeper on that. Uh, you mentioned that you'll get their best effort because they were in a dogfight when they came down here. But how might that play to your team's confidence to know that you were that close uh, and can compete with this team? Well, from a philosophical standpoint, you, you try to look at those things and think that maybe they become a reality. I, I remember working for a coach once, uh, Coach Eddie Sutton. I worked with him about eight months. And he, 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 get, he had a theory that every team you play – has a, a mental edge on one of the other and circumstances would allow them to be motivated for, any, for some different particular reasons and you could never let another team have that mental advantage because you can control that. Sometimes it's very difficult to get everyone playing as hard as they can as because of the respect they have for, for the name on their jersey. Sometimes it's national TV. Sometimes it's wherever the teams rank, their reputation, uh, where they are in the in the standing, mm -hmm. motivates one team over another. And then sometimes it's fear and respect that that you have for one another. Um, and most of the time, that's why you see teams now, like Pittsburgh, for instance, they they started five transfers, older guys. I think three of them might have been in graduate school, and that's the new wave of, of college basketball. It's really putting a unfortunate challenge on high school incoming players because most guys now are waiting around to see who's going to be available in the portal. And then you ask asking yourself, do I want a 21-year-old kid or do I take a 17-, 18-year-old guy who's still growing and developing and got to gain some weight, so forth, so on. So all of that plays into the mindset of what a – how you prepare. An older, more mature team make less mistakes. They've been through the game. They, they don't get mentally distracted. And sometimes with a, a, a team like ours, um, sometimes uh, they're growing and developing uh, that mindset that you have to have to win. So we hope that we want the game more than, than Clemson feel like they need the game. I think two or three of those guys for Pitt were actually sixth-year guys, not just fifth-year guys. So yeah, they're yeah. Cer certainly experienced. Uh, you know, and, and bringing it back to your team, Matthew Cleveland, who's <laughs> logged a lot of minutes, but he's in his second year, right? And I know he was battling back spasms the other day. Uh, but I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about him from the standpoint that he was named one of ten finalists for the Julius Irving Award, uh, which and they don't call it the Dr. J Award, but I'm going to call it that. But, I mean, he's the only player from the ACC, and that, that speaks to how, how his game is, is becoming more and more well-rounded and more, he's becoming more consistent. Well, there's no doubt that Matthew has had a tremendous impact on our team, uh, especially when you take on consideration he's a sophomore. Um, you know, he has such great determination. He has a high basketball IQ. Um, he understands everything that we're doing, and and he really probably could uh, could teach it as well as anybody. But but he's a very focused guy. Not all not always talkative. But but his competitive spirit has allowed him to attack rebounds and baskets on a consistent basis, and and that's has been his biggest contribution. Uh, he's gone from shooting poorly. From the from the three point line, in high and uh, as a freshman, to now shooting some shooting somewhere around forty, percent from three. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's off close. Um, in in uh, the regular season, this says a lot about his hard work, his determination, and how focused he was during the summer, so that he could put himself in a position where he could improve like that. That's not an easy feat to do, and I think that he's checked all the boxes. Were you a Dr. J guy back in the day, by the way? Well, I watched him as much <laughs> as I could with the big afro. <laughs> it's amazing to me how big his hands were, were, were and how clever he was with utilizing it. He was a good athlete, but he's a very clever, smart guy. And um, him, him being a Hall of Famer, um, if he's not already inducted to the Hall of Fame, I think he's one of the best of all times in what he did. And he brought a lot of flair to the game, um, not because he was being fancy. He just had unusual physical attributes. His hands were so large that he could always catch the ball in one hand. He could do things and move it around, pass and shoot and f finish plays. 
but because of that, so he's one of those guys that I think. Well, they were, he was born. He was born to play <laughs> basketball. <laughs> uh, thanks for the walk down memory lane, and congratulations to Matthew Cleveland. It's a nice honor to be in the final ten for that uh, for that award. We will continue our conversation with Coach Leonard Hamilton momentarily. Did you know that FSU athletics is self-supported and isn't funded by tax dollars? Because of this. We rely on fans just like you to join Seminole Boosters so your teams have the best possible chance to achieve success on and off the court. Seminole Booster membership starts at $5 per month and comes with a great membership uh, set of benefits. Go online to SeminoleBoosters.com to learn more or join. That is SeminoleBoosters.com. We are at Glory Days Grill. This is Inside Seminole Basketball with head coach Leonard Hamilton, and we will continue talking hoops right after this. This is uh, FSU Basketball from Learfield. Good evening once again, and uh, welcome back to Glory Days Grill. I'll tell you what, Chuck Walsh, who does such a great job for sports information, I didn't realize that he's also uh, the mic man in, in break here for those who are uh, in the house. And uh, Leonard, I'll start where he finished. He just asked a question about Deontay Green, he, and, and Deontay uh, hit a big three against Pitt the other day. When we played up at Pitt, he, he gave you some good minutes at the end as you got that win. Uh, obviously, he still got that knee brace on, and and you didn't get a full preseason, and has been working back into shape. But but what do you see from Deontay so far? Well, De- Deontay is a youngster that had abs- he injured his he had an ACL tear last um, eight, uh, January, so he was on the red shirt list. We didn't think that he would. It made any sense for him to play at all this year because. Mo- Sometimes it just takes kids a long time to recover, but he started making such great progress, and so now and then we as we lost Ganey and Fletcher, um, he he really really wanted to play, but he didn't get in. He hadn't had any contact practices from May on, because we were just trying to let him rehab his his um, his, his uh, ACL, and so he actually played in a game with maybe having two days of practice because he he was not released from his injury mm-hmm. uh, until the week of that particular game I don't know which I can't remember which one it was so so we um we, we this unfortunate circumstances that he had to come in and step right in and be efficient without any practice similar to Chandler Jackson who broke his thumb and he was eight weeks away and um, I think he practiced two or three days in we had him in the middle of a game, so they missed a lot of drill work uh, that gives you the confidence that because you learn through repetition over and over and over. Uh, but he is a great youngster, very good student. Um, <clears throat> uh, he's um, a, a, co- a combo player, um, maybe more three, four than he is five, but because we, we don't have a lot of depth in the center position, we've had to utilize him that when people have – smaller centers who step out on the perimeter and shoot the ball and similar to what uh, Sp- Pittsburgh does sometimes. You mentioned Chandler Jackson. That's where I was going to go next. He had a, a career-high nine assists last week against uh, Syracuse midweek and uh, seemed like he just brought some hustle and energy in when he got in, in the second half against Pitt the other day. But uh, despite missing all that time or, or even though he missed all that time, how is he progressing now? Well, I think his defense has gotten, has gotten better. And there's no doubt about that. And I think that his poise, he doesn't panic. Uh, we trying to, we want him to be aggressive, uh, a little more aggressive offensively. I think he's, now he's starting to shoot the ball well from the perimeter. He shoots well in practice all the time. But uh, once he gets in the game, sometimes it's, it's a little more challenging for him. That's just because of his youth, um, youthful experience. And, and he uh, has, in the Syracuse game, the fact that he was able to get nine assists, gosh, I mean, <laughs> that says a little bit about his ability to understand how to attack zone defenses. And sometimes that's not always easy, especially for a freshman. Yeah, it was it was great to see. And then uh, going back to the point you made earlier about uh, bigger rotation, those two guys are part of it. Also, Baba Miller continues to come along, and I know he he's the same thing. He needs to get more experience, more time on the court. Well, Bob is, is very interesting uh, situation because, you know, he's really, really a good shooter from the perimeter. 
and I think he was like 6'4", and grew to be like 6'11", he said, but we think he's 7 foot. He <laughs> just he doesn't want to be called a 7 footer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that philosophy. But um, he's very good with handling the ball, passing the ball. I, I just think that, though, he's one of those guys who cares so much about his teammates, and he wants to contribute so so much to his the, the betterment of our team, I, I think he's putting a lot of pressure on himself. And so if he makes a mistake, I can just see his facial expression being, expressing the fact that, man, you know, I got to do better and he's putting too much pressure on himself as opposed to just relaxing and going out and, 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 and giving all he has. So that's part of the growth um, with a first-year youngster. So that's part of the development that we're going through with most of our, our young guys and uh, once we get through it, I think we're going to come out on, on the good side because uh, he's extremely talented. How challenging has it been for you and your staff, given that normally when you've got a full complement of players at the start of the year, you can tinker with the rotation and when you put certain guys in and who they're playing with and how long their breaks are. You're working that out in November and December, but really the way this year has gone, you, you didn't have that luxury. And uh, so, so how difficult has it been to still kind of be tinkering at this point? Well, there's no doubt that there are things that we still are teaching in February that we should have been confident and consistent with in October, November, December. Mm -hmm. But that, that's because you have, you normally have juniors and seniors on your team to kind of set the table and pick up games in the apartments, in the locker room, what have you, to pass on the wisdom that they've gained, you know, from playing in the league for two or three years. And when you're a void of that, you know, the, even the, the phys physicality of the game. You got guys who are bigger and stronger, been lifting weights. They understand the system. They've been successful on the road. They've they've had some failures. So you gain wisdom through those experiences, and we don't have anybody to share that with them. It's easy to say, well, why don't the coaches share it with them? Well, if those of you who have uh, children or teenagers growing up, it's, it's easier said than done. <laughs> and... Um, you just, you just got to keep at it, and we don't have to change our formula, but we have to understand that people, uh, people, different people learn at a different rate, and we have to in, not only speak to them as a group, but we also have to in, in, uh, individualize it by having staff meetings with them, film sessions or something like that, just to kind of make sure they understand why we're asking them to do whatever we need to have them do. Next opportunity for your group will come Wednesday night at Clemson Airtime, 6.30, right here on the Seminole Radio Network from Learfield. Hey, T-Spark Enterprises, want a guaranteed win? Call T-Spark for your next roofing or construction project. We conquer all peaks. T-SparkConstruction.com. We'll be back to continue our conversation with Coach Leonard Hamilton from Glory Days Grill right after this. This is Inside Seminole Basketball from Learfield. And good evening once again. We're at Glory Days Grill, and I've asked enough questions that I'm going to take a break, at least for this moment, Coach, and uh, we'll go out to our, our uh, live audience, so to speak. Go ahead and say hello. What's your question for Coach? Coach, how you doing? Hello. Hello there, <laughs> Coach. <laughs> you know, as I, as I review the stats from this year's team, I get really, really excited about the potential of this group moving forward. I Just reviewing these stats of your team coach you got nine plus guys that have averaged 10 plus minutes this season including i think five guys that are kind of flirting around the 30 minute mark wow. unbelievable experience in college basketball i think you got eight guys that have consistently scored the ball for you including four guys that are in double figures from 10.5 to 14.5, and that doesn't even include Jalen uh, Worley, who was mentioned earlier, that is averaging eight a game and had 23 against Pitt on Saturday, one of the two teams leading the league. In addition to all that experience and production that you have returning potentially next year, you got three guys that are barely scratching the surface. Certainly Bubba Miller is just, I think we would all agree, just scratching the surface in college basketball after not being able to play the first 16 games. 
Uh, Cam Fletcher, who has had a chance to play one game in the ACC, and certainly Jalen Ganey, who hasn't been able to play a minute this year. Three guys that potentially could be starters, maybe in your top seven, eight, or nine. And so with all that returning, I'm really excited about the potential of this group. I think this group has had to take its lumps and go through its growing pains, but there's always another side, and I'm excited about that other side. I'd be just be interested in your thoughts about this group moving forward. Well, no doubt, a, a, a great observation, and you're right on point, but, but I do believe that we need a little bit more maturity, uh, and that's the positive thing about the transfer portal. Um, and, you, you know, you can find ways with the new rules that govern college sports. Um, I think we're going to be able to bring in some uh, more experienced guys to give us a little more mature um, atmosphere on our team that I think will with the right people blending with the, some of the ones we have coming back, I, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. But we're working hard, and the, the rules are such that you can't tamper with people because you don't know who's going to be, uh, be available in that portal. But last year was about 1,800, close to 2,000 kids. And so I think it would be more probably of the same. And uh, when you see a team like Pittsburgh who – Starts five transfers, a team like Clemson who has, you know, and Wake Forest and Miami for that matter, you know, they're, they're bringing in transfers and they're more competitive than teams with more talented high school kids are, are, not, be, are not faring as well consistently with teams that are more mature. So hopefully we'll have the right combination of maturity and young players next year to make them – to get us back to where we've been and maybe beyond. We're excited about that group coming together, Coach. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Coach, one of the names he mentioned, Cameron Fletcher, mm -hmm. uh, is here tonight. He's going to join us in our next segment, and I know uh, he's, been, he's been on the shelf injured since early December, but uh, why don't you share a little bit about Cameron for our audience, uh, both here in person and listening on the network. Well, Cam's one of my favorite guys, that, and sometimes you don't like to say that as a coach, but because he's had, a, he's had it tough. And he's so committed to wanting to do things the right way. He's so committed to wanting to be a student of the game. Uh, he put given tremendous effort in the ac in the academic areas, and he's he's a little bit like I, I was. I was very proud of my 2.5 grade point average. <laughs> 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 I work hard. <laughs> so I found out I need to have better grades to get into graduate school. <laughs> I turned it up a notch. But my, my Cam is determined to get his degree. Uh, he, he wants to be uh, in real estate. But we're going to find a way to help him start gaining some knowledge and experience in that area. If there are any realtors out there who need an intern during the summer, <laughs> give me a call. Uh, but but um, that's what he's interested in doing. So I'm, I'm very proud of him and the progress he's made. And he's probably the most energetic guy on our basketball team when he comes on the floor. He's, he knows one speed, and, and he doesn't take any possessions off. And I'm looking forward to getting him back 100% along with Ganey and the additional players that we'll probably bring in out of the portal so we can, we can get back to competing for those championships. Coach, I'm going to ask him this question, but I'm curious from your standpoint. A lot of times when guys are injured – uh, you know, you can be a little isolated and not feel like you're as, as much a part of the team because you can't get out there and play. You can't do the same things at practice. How do you as a, as a head coach and, and your staff try to make sure that guys can stay as dialed in and feel a part of the team even when they're, they're out injured? Well, that's been a little bit of a challenge for him because his, his heart's always heavy by not being able to contribute. And I don't think he likes coming to practice other than he know I'll, I'll cut his hair if he doesn't show up on practice. <laughs> so, but most of the time he's getting treatment. I'm just trying to get him to, to get a, Ham, a Leonard Hamilton haircut, and that's that's been a little bit of a challenge. I don't know if I'm gonna quite get that done, <laughs> but but I do believe though that that's been a challenge for him, just being in the mix and knowing that he wants to be out there. And to his credit, though, uh, he was scheduled to go on the last road trip with us to Louisville, and he said he didn't think he he wanted to go because he has some academic work he had to catch up on. I almost passed out 
when he said that to me. <laughs> I, I had to look, make sure I was who I was talking to. But he's getting very serious about his academics. He thinks it's important. He's uh, he's told his mother that he's going to get his degree, and that's part of the process. So on the basketball court, he'll take care of his business. On the, but on that, from a maturity standpoint, being from St. Louis, uh, I think that he's he's on the right path. You're being pretty modest about the academic success of your guys, by the way, <laughs> given the track record you have. So I'll toot your horn if you won't. But uh, appreciate those comments. We'll talk with Cameron Fletcher coming up in our next segment, and then I'll get some final thoughts from you uh, about the big matchup in just a little bit. Okay. All righty. Uh, more basketball talk is coming up. Hey, Florida Farm Bureau members get free tickets to select FSU men's basketball games. Just visit, visit myffbf.org to sign into your account. Then follow the prompts for attractions and sports and sporting events to get your two free tickets. Tickets are offered on a first-come, first-served basis and are subject to availability. Not a Farm Bureau member? Again, visit myffbf.org and register to become a member today. Farm Bureau Insurance, proud to support Seminole Athletics. Cameron Fletcher is up next when we continue with Inside Seminole Basketball from Learfield. Good evening once again, and Coach Hamilton will rejoin us momentarily, but uh, we are joined by Cameron Fletcher. It's always great to have the, the student athletes come out and uh, say hello. He's got a smile on his face, and I know you've had a chance to, to mingle with some of the Seminole fans here. Uh, Cameron, originally from St. Louis, been at Florida State the last couple of years, and unfortunately, as we just talked about with Coach, uh, season-ending injury back in, in December against Virginia. So I guess, first of all, uh, whatever you'd like to share about how your rehab is, is coming along, how it's coming along thus far. Uh, rehab is great. Um, I've just been taking it serious and keeping my head up and cheering my teammates on. So, any uh, Can you give us a little bit idea of uh, how much time are you spending rehab? Is it? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you're pretty acquainted with the, the training room at this point. Yeah, I've been in there every day. Uh, <laughs> it's five days a week, sometimes six, uh, maybe two hours or so. I just asked Coach this, but I, I want your um, thoughts on it, so to speak. When, when you can't get out there and play, I mean, you can root for your team, but it's not the same when you can't get out there with them. So how difficult has that part of the equation been for you? Uh, it's been tough just knowing I could help my team and seeing my teammates' faces when we uh, lose games. It, it kind of hurts me a little bit, but um, just trying to stay good mentally and just keep – motivate my teammates to keep pushing because the season's not over yet. We still got games left and we still got the AC tournament, so we can turn it around. It's not too late. Is this the first time, you, is the most significant injury you've had to battle back from, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, so this is this is new to you. Um, where does your energy come from? Coach was talking about your energy when you're out there on the court. I mean, where, where does that come from? I've always been like that. I just never, as a kid, I didn't even used to sit down, so that's just something naturally that just was given to me. But was it siblings? Was it a coach somewhere? Was it the first time you got out into a game? I mean, you can't you can't put your finger on it. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what uh, you know in your role uh, to expound upon it a little bit? Uh, are you trying to to be a sort of a mentor to some of the younger guys? I mean, you're not exactly an old guy yourself, but you have played more basketball than some of these guys. I yeah. Mean, um, you try and take them under your wing and, and coach them up a little bit. Yeah, uh, like Cam Cornhead, I try to take him under my wing probably the most because I see a lot of potential with him. Not saying I don't see potential in other teammates, but I just see a lot of potential in Cam. So I try to take him out of wing the most and just let him know right from wrong and what spots he should be in and things like that. What is it? What's the potential you see in him? I mean, what jumps out? I just see a lot of him and me. I don't. I, it, I can't explain it, but I just see a lot of him and me. And when I just see him doing things wrong sometimes, I just know I got to say something because I see a lot in him. Basketball, uh, you know, whether you're winning or losing, basketball season can be a grind because you just you play a game uh, and then you got to flush it, win or lose, because two days later you're playing another game. Yeah. When, when you look at what's happened with this team this year, I mean, it, even Saturday's the latest example. I mean, you're right in the game for 36 minutes out of the 40. You don't come out on top. That can be tough emotionally. So how do you help the team get past that? Because it does no good to look back. you got to look forward to Clemson right now. Yeah, that's what I tell them, chin up and uh... – just try to get the next one. You can't dwell off the loss. I mean, it hurts to lose, but after the game, we just keep our head up and go on to the next game. We're talking with uh, Cameron Fletcher, who uh, arrived at Florida State last year. Now, you didn't uh, 
come to Florida State out of high school, but you transferred in. Uh, I'm curious what, what was the attraction uh, when, when Coach Hamilton got on the phone or whoever it was, and then you said, you know what, Florida State's where I'm, where I'm going to make my home. I, honestly, I, I wanted to come my freshman year, but Florida State didn't recruit me, Coach Ham. So, <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't recruit me, but um, talking to Coach Ham and see why on the phone, it was, uh, it was a great feeling. Because uh, after the situation happened in Kentucky, I don't want to get into that, but Coach Ham just had a lot of faith in me, and I trusted him with my, with my life, basically, because I feel like college is going to be the last place where like, people actually care about you. And I, I feel like here at Florida State, the coaches really care about you. So uh, just talking to Coach Ham and CY was, was a great feeling, and they took me and they had a lot of trust in me, so I appreciate them for that. We're talking with Cameron Fletcher, and uh, this interview is presented by Rising Spear. To support Florida State student-athletes and donate, head to the website risingspear.com. You realize you just called your coach out in a live TV radio program here, right? <laughs> I thought, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get to know a little bit more about Cameron Fletcher when we continue, and uh, it's good to have him out here at Glory Days Grill. So take a break, then we'll come back talk about his favorite city in the world. It's, uh, it's his hometown. He'll enlighten us a little bit about that hometown. When we continue on Inside Seminole Basketball from Glory Days Grill and from Learfield. <laughs> And Leonard Hamilton will be back next segment as we finish things up, but we continue our conversation with Cameron Fletcher from the Florida State basketball team. And, again, this segment is presented by Rising Spear. Go to risingspear.com to support Florida State student-athletes and donate. All right, Cameron, uh, I think the, the audience here at Glory Days Grill is aware because uh, they just got asked a question, but uh, your hometown is St. Louis, best city in the world. Best I'm going to guess you haven't been to every city in the world, but what do you love about St. Louis? Oh, it's just my city, man. Um, a lot of people made it out of St. Louis that's like kind of slept on, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, St. Louis is a great city. Uh, yeah, I don't really got much to say about it. Well, but music, food, I mean, you got to give us a little more now. Uh, I just like how we like the underdog, like how nobody really knows about our city. Like when I tell people that I'm from St. Louis, they ask me, is it country there? It's not country at all, but... <laughs> Well, that sounds a little like you have a chip on your shoulder. Then is that is that a little bit of what motivates love, you and, yeah. and how you play? A little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Tell tell our uh, listeners and Seminole fans a little bit more about you. So, if you're not playing basketball, and I realize if you're a D1 athlete playing basketball, you're playing a lot of basketball. Lot and of basketball. when it's not organized practice, you're in the gym shooting. I get that. But when you do take a break, what what things are you doing? Uh, lately, I've been just playing a game. I've been um, rapping with some teammates lately. Because I have nothing else to do. Uh, I like the golf, but I can't because of my knee right now. So, them probably are my three three main hobbies that I like to do. All right. So, who's the best rapper on the team? Mike Brown. <laughs> okay. And then me. And then you. Yeah, then me. All right. Uh, well, at least you gave the honors to somebody else. Yeah. Who who Who's the best golfer on the team? Probably RJ. RJ, he'll walk on. All right. He's probably the best golfer. All right. And I don't know if you want to do this because he's sitting right over there. Who does the best Coach Ham impression? Naheem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know if he's been out for a show yet, but I'll pass that along to Jeff, and we'll ask him to do the, uh, the impression. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, when, when – uh, I know you're still uh, hobbling around a little bit. Uh, you know, when, when is the light at the end of the tunnel for you in terms of coming back from this knee injury, do you think? Well, right now I'm just taking my time with it, taking rehab serious, so I'm not really rushing the process. So – Whenever my time is, whenever it's my time, that's when I'm, uh, yeah. As soon as you lose those crutches over there, you're probably shooting already, though, but you're doing it on one oh, leg, no. right? You working on the free throw stroke? I, can, I or can't what? really put pressure on my foot, so no, I can't do that right can't now. Can't do that yet. Yeah. Uh, another, another few weeks, yeah. then they'll, they'll have you out there at the strike. Well, what, what's the message that you share with your teammates as you guys go into this, the, the final couple of weeks of the regular season? And a big opportunity at Clemson, tough place to play at Little mm -hmm. John on Wednesday. Uh, but, but what message do you, do you give to your teammates? I just like to tell my teammates stay motivated, keep pushing each other because it's not over yet. We still got a couple games left, and we still got the ACC tournament. So hold our heads high, and let's try to win the tournament and make the tournament. All right. I like it. I like it. And when you get back, uh, uh, who, who – I didn't ask you this question. I should have asked at the start. I mean, who, who do you model your game after? I mean, who do you like watching play? Mm. I don't really model my game other than nobody. I got. Right. I don't really look at it like who who do I play like or who do I want to play like. I just play like me. 
just play like yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Cameron Fletcher, ladies and gentlemen, let's get a big round of applause here for Cam. Good luck on the, on the comeback trail. I know it's tough when you're out. It's good. Appreciate Enjoy the it. conversation. Thank you. And uh, everybody, make sure you put St. Louis on the bucket list if you haven't <laughs> been there, right? All right, we'll come back, get some final thoughts from head coach Leonard Hamilton uh, right after this. Truist is a proud partner of Seminole Athletics and the official retail bank of Florida State. Care, it's a total bank changer. See how at truist.com. Inside Seminole Basketball continues in a moment from Learfield. A few minutes to go. We'll talk uh, about the matchup on Wednesday against Clemson here momentarily. Coach, I wanted to ask you, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to ask you about uh, Darren Green Jr. You, you mentioned in the first segment that, uh, you know, this is new to him. I mean, they've got – he, he, they were trapping him every time he touched the ball. And, uh, um, you know, it can be so challenging. One, he's having to work so hard to get free. And then, two, when you're a shooter like him, you want to make sure that you're still taking a good shot when you have the opportunity and not forcing it. So how do you work with him on, on dealing with kind of the newfound pressure that he's seeing? Well, it's not as much we have to work with him. Is that, that that's what we are with our team development. You remember when, Pat, uh, when Patrick Savoy, Mm -hmm. When he was here, he was a similar knockdown shooter. We, it, he always, he, we all, <coughs> excuse me, we always found him in transition. And that meant that we had a big man running down the floor that took guards with him, and we were pushing it, and people had to back up <coughs> to keep it from attacking the basket. And then on the kick, uh, he was always open. We have to, in order for him to get good shots, we, we, we need to move the ball better and move our body quicker, quicker so that you create indecision on the defense. And we're not doing a very good job of that, and we're allowing people to load up on him. Well, that's something you'll continue to work on. I know when you uh, get out on the court tomorrow and start working on Clemson, you'll continue to work on that. Coach needs to get a glass of water here real quick. But the Clemson game is coming up 7 o'clock on, uh, on Wednesday night. And uh, Jeff Colhane will have the call. The coverage will start at 6.30. It'll be Jeff and uh, Adrian Crawford on the call. That I'll let you take a sip, Coach. But, uh, you know, you look back at the first Clemson game, and you know, you know this uh, Tiger team well. What are some of the keys and some of the things you need to see from your team to, to come away with a victory on Wednesday night? Well, one of the main things that we did against Clemson last time, we kept the big inside player kindly in check. So he <coughs> – he wasn't uh, as effective as he normally is. And they, they have a good, they have an older, more mature team. So we got to be careful not to key on any one particular person. What we need to do is have our defense, the system sound, and we execute it. And on the offensive end, we have to move the ball better, and we got to attack the, the basket a lot more and, and get some paint touches a lot more than what we've been getting. If, if not, they're just going to load up on us on the perimeter and create the same problems. We spent some time in practice today working with our big guys, catching lobs and slots and being able to get the, get the ball with two feet in the paint. And hopefully that will be, you'll see an improvement in the area, and I think that's going to open up a lot of opportunities for, for Mr. Green. I know you chart touches and, and passes in a game. Uh, maybe that changes depending on the opponent and how much you're trying to move them around, but is there a benchmark you're shooting for and to, and to when you're talking about reversing the basketball and making the defense work? When, when we make 230 passes, we never, we very seldom ever lose. And if we are 70% correct on our defensive principles, we very seldom lose. And that's all the little things that we try to emphasize. I think we have about nine or ten things that we grade every game. Close out, check, uh, contesting the, the pass, contesting shots, containing the dribble, sealing the baseline getting to the dead front, jumping to the ball, those things that in the direction of the pass, those things we grade each individual on, uh, and we try to hold them accountable. But that's where we've been probably faltering as much as anything this year. Get another opportunity against Clemson. Coach, as, as you get to this point in the season, I mean, it's been a long time since you first rolled the ball out and uh, back in September, October. Uh, Mentally, how do you keep the guys fresh and dialed in for, for another opportunity in 40 minutes of playing ball? We try to monitor our practices a little bit, not ha have much, nearly as much of a grind and, 
and try to, you know, walk through things. But it's difficult walking through things with at a slow speed when you have as many first and second year players. So, but this is part of who we are. And, and like the uh, guy who answered the question, uh, Mr. Platt, the other day, I mean a few minutes ago, our future is bright. We're just gonna, we need to bring in a couple of kids that, that fit in, and I think we'll be back to what we've been accustomed to seeing here at Florida State. All right, thank you, Coach. And he shared the Scott and Wallace keys to success, the official law firm of the Florida State Seminoles, 222 777